in the loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Governments cracking down on big tech around the world. Tonight, we get a look at Russia's ultra strict approach to social media and the backlash. Then all that infrastructure talk on Capitol Hill can get old real fast. So instead of breaking down the back and forth, we're taking you to West Virginia and actually giving you a look at what the money could do for one highway system there. But first, we're diving into cryptocurrency. This week, the US Justice Department launched new efforts to keep a more watchful eye on cryptocurrency and cybercrime. But while the US government seems skeptical of digital currency, around the world, many other nations are embracing cryptocurrency in new ways, whether making crypto an official currency or just pushing their citizens to use it. That's right, it's not just the Bitcoin bros in your group chats who are buying into this, it's whole governments. And that trend could completely reimagine the relationship between governments and financial markets, or it could become just another failed economic experiment. The appeal of cryptocurrency is that saying the word crypto is in vogue, but also it's a cheaper, quicker, and easier way to spend and move money that lets people have more control over their finances. Or at least that's the appeal for individual users like you and me all over the world. But the big question here is, why are some governments buying in? To help us make it make sense, we reached out to cryptocurrency expert Jeff Bandman. You know, you have hyperinflation where people don't really trust the central bank or they don't trust the government's monetary policy you know, are places where it's gotten a lot of uh, traction. And, you know, in a way, it's, it's a way of either outsourcing uh, monetary policy, or it's a way of saying, you know, we're not going to peg our currency to the dollar because we don't want to be just dependent on the US or the Euro or the UK or, or wherever else. You know, we, we trust this algorithm because it's transparent and we understand that. In September, El Salvador became the first country to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. Like many developing countries, El Salvador relies heavily on what's called the remittance market, meaning about $6 billion annually comes from Salvadorans working in the US sending money back to their families at home. With cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, money doesn't have to go through a bank. El Salvador's president, Nayib Bukele, says it will help cut back on transfer fees. The problem a lot of people run into is that banks take a decent chunk of the money they send home to their families. With Bitcoin, the people get more of the money. And worth noting here, roughly 70% of people in El Salvador don't have bank accounts. So instead, they can use an app on their phone created by the government that allows them to send and receive Bitcoin, completely removing the middleman. En lo personal me parece bastante excelente, una forma diferente, nueva, de poder usar dinero electrónico, ¿no? Me parece bastante bien. But this move has been met with a lot of opposition. A poll conducted last month found that more than two thirds of people in El Salvador didn't want Bitcoin coming to their country as a currency. Here's what one resident had to say. Pues por ahorita no creo. ¿Por qué? No, no lo entiendo. Va a ir bien difícil de entender. I think, frankly, um, the, the government of El Salvador could have done more to explain it. Uh, you know, I think it's also pretty new. Uh, people may not trust it, who are not uh, familiar with it. They don't see the value proposition. They, they think the currency that they already have uh, and the way they're able to use the dollar uh, is, is sufficient. But that's not the case for everybody. Other countries have other reasons for taking an interest in crypto. Let's take a look at Venezuela, for example. Their currency has been losing value for years as they've seen a lot of hyperinflation. The country launched their own form of crypto called the Petro back in 2018 with the goal of getting around US sanctions and helping Venezuelans preserve the value of their money. But many people didn't end up using it. I think part of the problem was the, the technology, but then I think they just didn't manage uh, the, the launch of it well. And, and it was really, it was aimed less at its own citizens and it was aimed more at kind of an offshore currency. Instead, many Venezuelans turned to other types of crypto like Bitcoin. Other Latin American countries like Panama, Paraguay, and Brazil have expressed interest in adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. Some government officials have tweeted photos with laser eyes to show their support, which is a choice. Honestly, if you just added a Kofi, Hotep Twitter would go wild. Experts say the big hurdle for governments interested in utilizing cryptocurrency is just helping their citizens understand how to use it and get comfortable with it. I'm pretty optimistic that I think this is just getting going. You know, this this has been happening for about 10 years and, uh, 
you know, it's just becoming a teenager and, uh, you know, uh, the, the adolescence could be a little bit, uh, you know, rocky and turbulent and maybe uh, emotional, but I think as it moves towards adulthood, I think that there's uh, a lot to look forward to. One other country that's toying around with the idea of an official digital currency is Ghana. Our reporter Nabil Ahmed Rufai brings us a closer look at the opportunities and the risks their government faces in embracing cryptocurrency. Nick Owusu trades in cryptocurrency. He uses Bitcoin for online transactions such as money transfers and investments. You are able to receive money and send money digitally anywhere in the world. And it's very fast, it's very convenient, and it's very cheap. Even though it's illegal in Ghana, Owusu has used Bitcoin for trading for more than six years. He says it comes with some risks when used for investments. If the demand for Bitcoin goes up, it goes, the value also goes up. If the demand for Bitcoin reduces, the value goes down. So if you are using it as a means of storing value, that is the only time you are exposed to these fluctuations in price. While there is a growing trend among Ghanaians trading in cryptocurrency, the central bank says it is illegal because it is unregulated. The government has warned people to stop trading with cryptocurrency. When you have a currency whose value is so unstable, really, you, you really cannot use it effectively uh, to meet any of the standard functions of money. And this is why I think there's a lot more emphasis on looking at uh, digital money, which is backed by the state, backed by the central banks. In September, Ghana's central bank began a pilot of a digital currency, ECD, that it wants to introduce into the economy. People from different parts of the country and socioeconomic backgrounds have been selected to test the ECD on mobile phone apps and smart cards. The central bank says the pilot phase will determine whether it's safe to release the digital currency on a broader scale for transactions. Analysts say more needs to be done to make it easy for Ghanaians to accept the ECD for financial services. In the threats, it's about the hackers and then the fraudulent you know, actors. So if you are able to handle them, then uh, there will be a smooth running of operations with regard to the ECD. Last year, cryptocurrency transfers to and from Africa reached more than $300 million, with Nigeria, South Africa and Kenya doing most of the transactions. Analysts do not want Ghana's central bank to rule out trading in cryptocurrency entirely, but rather find ways of regulating it. Nick Owusu says trading in cryptocurrency will continue in Ghana despite the warnings against it and strongly believes if it is regulated, Ghana's economy will benefit. Nabil Ahmed Rufai, for Newsy, Accra, Ghana. Here with us to talk a bit more about cryptocurrency, something I have not been able to figure out as Newsy's Tyler Adkison. Um, you know, Tyler, one of the defining features I've been told of crypto is that it's a decentralized economic system. Here's a three in one for you. What exactly does that mean? Why does it matter? And how could it affect cryptocurrencies going forward? So let, let's start with a little history here. Back in 2008, there was an individual who used the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto to publish a white paper that was basically uh, laying the groundwork and vision for what Bitcoin would end up being today. And in that paper, Nakamoto wrote that the goal of this electronic cash system um, was to basically allow payments to be sent directly from one party to another without having to go through a third party intermediary, which this is what we know is a decentralized system. Like the idea of it is that eventually the platform, as more people get onto it, the market would be controlled by, you know, a community of cryptocurrency holders with the power coming from the tokens they own rather than, say, a centralized bank or uh, some kind of government entity like that. Crypto advocates do say that in an ideal situation, this financial setup is basically intended to make it so that there is more financial inclusion for, you know, especially like people who don't have a bank account. That's one in 10 Americans here. But at the same time, it also comes with the risk of, you know, basically running in the Wild West where there isn't really a whole lot of ruling on how this all works and things like that. 
as I understand it, more governments are getting into the cryptocurrency game. I mean, some have even uh, created their own. Uh, how successful have governments been at regulating this industry that's looking to avoid traditional institutions? And that's where you kind of see the, the butting of heads here, because there's an appetite to regulate this market from a governmental standpoint, but the efforts are kind of few and far between right now. Um, you know, people holding cryptocurrency don't really want to see regulation, especially when the name of the game is exactly to avoid the people who want to regulate your industry at this point. Um, you know, the market is moving so fast and it's relatively new. So right now it's kind of unclear what regulatory areas cryptocurrency sits in. You know, for instance, the IRS calls cryptocurrencies properties. And by the nature of that, they think that you should be able to collect tax dollars on it. But the SEC has said that those digital assets may be securities, and they think that they should be able to regulate it. So really, however you define it also kind of boxes into how you want to regulate it. One other kind of regulation sort of outlook, not so much on the legal side, but more on the actual um, mechanics of it all is, you know, look at China. Um, China on September 24 said that, you know, all crypto transactions were illegal. And basically, and, and with that, they also outlined crypto mining in a certain provinces within the country. So, you know, these moves, anytime they make them also drastically shift the market. Um, keep in mind that, you know, 50% of all crypto mining is happening in China, and the US only accounts for about 17%. You know, after China outlawed mining, the price of Bitcoin dropped 10% right there. And so I think what's important to know is that Given the decentralized nature of all this, all sorts of countries are going to want to look into how they're going to be able to regulate it. It's just that that regulation is going to look different based on the goals of, are you trying to collect money? Are you trying to make sure that you're not putting greenhouse gases back into the environment? So, you know, it's kind of like a blind man and the elephant situation. Everyone's looking at the same thing, but they all have a different idea of how they want to approach it. That's a great way to put it. Tyler Adkison, thank you so much for clearing this up for us. We hope we see you again, man. Thank you. Up next, we're talking about what's been popping off on social media, ranging from a ruling on the Texas abortion law to a newly announced Nobel Prize winner. Social media can be a hellscape. Don't at me. But every once in a while, we run across something not so awful, like news about life-saving treatment for an illness that kills hundreds of thousands of people annually. Here's what's trending on social. The WHO approved the first ever vaccine for use against malaria. It's a rare disease in the US, but the WHO estimates it kills more than 400,000 people each year with children making up two thirds of those deaths. Malaria is a parasitic illness, which makes it harder to develop a vaccine for than viruses like COVID. And while this vaccine is less effective than the COVID vaccine, trials show it can still prevent 40% of malaria cases and save tens of thousands of children. The new vaccine will be rolled out for children in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world with high levels of malaria transmission. A federal judge granted the Justice Department's request to pause the enforcement on the Texas abortion ban, one of the strictest bans in the nation. In his ruling, the judge said from the moment the Texas Heartbeat Act, also known as SB 8, went into effect, women have been unlawfully prevented from exercising control over their lives in ways that are protected by the Constitution. The law bans abortions after about six weeks of pregnancy, which is before many people know that they're pregnant. While doctors won't be providing abortions right away, Wednesday's ruling pauses the abortion ban while the challenge to the law makes its way through federal courts. The Swedish Academy is announcing Nobel Prize winners this week and awarded Tanzanian author Abdul Razak Gurna the 2021 Nobel Prize in Literature Wednesday. Gurna is the first black African winner of the Nobel for Literature in over 35 years and is the first person ever from Tanzania to win a Nobel Prize. He told the Academy that the win was a complete surprise and tweeted his thanks earlier today to the people of Africa and all his readers. For those of you who have actually finished books during this pandemic instead of reading about half before moving to another, Gurna has published 10 books. So go ahead and start adding them to your Goodreads list, y'all. Speaking of things that are trending, earlier this week, Facebook's platforms, which also include Instagram and WhatsApp, were down for several hours. That outage came just one day after a whistleblower accused Facebook of misconduct. But Facebook is also fighting on another front. 
Russian government regulators are threatening to fine the social media giant up to 10% of its earnings if it doesn't delete certain posts. It's just the latest fight in a wider battle between Russian officials and US tech companies as Julia Chapman reports from Moscow. Nearly 90 million Russians use the internet every day. Most of them are on social media. But when users post content Russian authorities don't like, social media giants are asked to remove them. They don't always comply. Russian authorities uh, think that American giants are a kind of uh, threat for their internal policy, informational policy. And for sure, they want to be sure that uh, the companies block every, everything, every content, every account that Russian authorities says. And that's why it's so important to make companies comply with uh, modern Russian law. So authorities are looking for new levers of influence. They already demand that user data be stored inside Russia, while a new law requires major internet companies to open offices here and to follow local regulations. Our message is as follows. Open offices in Russia. We'll agree on the methods of cooperation. We'll explain anything in our laws that isn't understood. Go ahead and earn money, pay taxes and act in a civilized manner. We are calling for a civilized relationship with the Russian people, the Russian citizens and our sovereign territory. What approach they'll take, time will tell, but we have a fairly wide range of tools. Those tools became more apparent in last month's parliamentary elections. Ahead of the vote, activists linked to jailed opposition figure Alexei Navalny developed an app that recommended candidates most likely to defeat the ruling party. On the day that voting began, Apple and Google removed the app from their stores and blocked it from working. A letter from Apple published by activists said the move was related to the group's extremist status in Russia. Navalny said big tech had become an accomplice for President Vladimir Putin. Russia's regulator has issued dozens of fines against Facebook, Twitter, Google and others. But the recent elections revealed a shift, both in the scale of the threats and in the apparent willingness to comply with them. There's no doubt that pressure is growing on tech and social media firms, but the Russian market is substantial. The question for these companies is how far they're willing to compromise. Julia Chapman for Newsy, Moscow. Stay with us for more ITL after the break. We'll bring you more from our Two America series, taking a look at a new effort to boost Hispanic and Latino owned farms. Hispanic Americans make up more than three quarters of farm workers in the U.S., but only 3% of farm owners. The fastest Hispanic growth throughout the country is in rural areas, but they still lack access to farmland. As part of our Two America series, national reporter Matt Pearl takes us to a farm in North Carolina that was a gift from neighbors who are working as allies to fight against this disparity. To run a farm is to peer a farm. It is to plant seeds and wait months, to cultivate land for growth and a legacy for generations. It is to dream for miles, even if you only run an acre. On a small plot in Hendersonville, North Carolina, Delia Jovel and fellow immigrants from El Salvador and Mexico pick strawberries and pack corn. It's their food to keep and sell on a space they call Tierra Fertil, or fertile land. With no experience, okay. with no equipment, it was a, a big risk, but we are a little bit passionate. We are not a little bit, we are really passionate about this. Trust is so important to feel comfortable in a country that is not yours. Among farm workers in the United States, the Hispanic community makes up 77%. Among farm owners, they make up 3%. Almost everyone else. The community here is invisible. Looks more like Ed Graves. He runs a farm in Hendersonville with his partner, KP Whaley. 
If you are an immigrant in this country, you do not have the money or the access to people or resources to buy a bunch of land. A recent Senate study found the fastest Hispanic growth in America in rural areas. Since 2010, the Hispanic community in North Carolina has grown 27%. In neighboring Tennessee, 34%. It's grown 50% in Montana, 66% in South Dakota, and 129% in North Dakota. No matter what the state, the community is growing, but ownership of land, especially on farms, remains elusive. Because you don't have time to say, ah, oh, I, I'm gonna try something different. The main reason why you are here is because you need a stable income. You just need a job. Delia began Tierra Fertil in 2020. She recruited a small group to grow foods for their community. Their one acre. Wow, that's amazing. Was offered by Ed and KP. That's good. No rent, no strings, no limits. You know, KP and I are gay farmers. Like we're also marginalized in this community. So we kind of reached out because we want to band together. There's this sense um, for people that don't have a lot of resources in the society that land is power. Um, and what our shared project is, is about building community power. It is one acre on shared land. It does not erase the many hurdles of immigrant existence. What is your dream? Our dream is being able to create, uh, I'm going to say that, a movement. In the morning, Delia and her team will head to their day jobs, as they always do. Es mi hija, Valentina. But from 5 o'clock until sunset, they are here. The first brick on a path of hope. It's not how much do you farm, it's why do you farm. And for us, one acre uh, is enough. In Hendersonville, North Carolina, I'm Matt Pearl. Can you define infrastructure? If you can't, you're not alone. When you're back, we're talking about the infrastructure bill and how Congress is working to determine what falls into this category. There's been a lot of talk about the infrastructure bill, and with each step forward, they're like three steps back with this thing. The Senate did pass a $1 trillion package that would fund things like roads, bridges, and even broadband. But that's held up in the House as Congress debates a broader social spending bill that would invest in childcare, paid leave, healthcare, education, and the fight against climate change. Democratic leaders say they want to get it all done before the end of the month. The thing is, not everyone on Capitol Hill agrees with what infrastructure is. And as society continues to develop, some would agree the definition of infrastructure has also expanded, as the need for more things has arisen in cities. Take broadband, for example. In the bipartisan infrastructure package, $65 billion has been allocated for broadband development. According to the FCC right now, 19 million Americans still lack access to fixed broadband service at threshold speeds. With remote work and learning becoming a part of people's everyday norms, especially over the last year, it's not hard to see access to high-speed internet as a part of our country's infrastructure. But other things aren't quite as easy to argue. They sort of fall in this gray area, and it's not a Democrat versus Republican thing. Right now, the most important debate is happening between Democrats negotiating how much all of this is going to cost. When most people think of infrastructure, the most common things that come to mind are roads and bridges. Of course, there's still a ton of money allocated to these types of projects. One of the projects specifically mentioned in the bipartisan bill is the Appalachian Development Highway, which is set to get over a billion dollars in funding. Newsy Stephanie Liebergen shows us what the debate in Washington could mean for an often overlooked part of rural America. In the rural Appalachian Mountains, there aren't a lot of ways to get from point A to point B. Transportation officials have been working for decades to give some of the most isolated counties in the country an economic lifeline to neighboring regions. Funding for the regional project has been hard to come by in recent years, but that's about to change. The bipartisan infrastructure plan will make billions of dollars available to states across the country, but one of the few projects to get dedicated funding is this one, the Appalachian Development Highway System. 
it'll take years. Uh, literally years off the completion. The Appalachian Development Highway System spans across parts of 12 states and the entirety of West Virginia. The infrastructure bill sets aside $1.25 billion for the system. States will share those funds with West Virginia set to get the second largest amount, about $195 million. This is the number one priority in the entire state. We're going to finish Corridor H. Corridor H runs east to west, connecting rural counties with key interstates in the Mountain State and neighboring Virginia. The finished portions of the road have already had a positive impact on local businesses. In the middle of the pandemic, we're still thriving. You know, people were coming for outdoor recreation. People that had never been here before utilized the road and were like, you know, we had always heard about West Virginia and pulled the trigger and decided to come. But the final path of the unfinished sections is still to be determined. We got involved in this because it was getting into an area that we knew and there were things that we cared about and that we thought were being ignored that were precious to us. Hugh Rogers was involved in a 1990s lawsuit that successfully fought to move the road's path away from some historical landmarks. They wound up changing 40% of the, of the alignment from what you see right over here all the way to Virginia. The part that was in dispute at the canyon is still in dispute. We, our settlement agreement couldn't really settle that. We sort of agreed to disagree. West Virginia will use some of its federal funding to build a new section of Corridor H. That will build a four lane highway across this valley and over the Cheat River. Construction beyond that is among the most heavily contested. Judy Rod is the director of Friends of Blackwater, a group focused on preserving the natural beauty of the region and the 10,000 acre Blackwater Canyon. We're most concerned about impacts to Blackwater Canyon, which to us is absolutely sacred ground, and to the two charming little historic towns that uh, the proposed route would go between. Those small towns, Thomas and Davis, are home to just about 1,200 people, but not all the new traffic is a good thing. Truckers trying to take advantage of completed sections of the highway end up on small mountain roads they really shouldn't use, which can lead to big problems, especially in the winter. When the snow does fly, it really does uh, quickly change the road conditions, and if experienced truck drivers are not um, prepared for that, there has been quite a few times where the road has been, been shut down to clean up a traffic. The bipartisan infrastructure funding will cover just a fraction of what West Virginia needs to finish construction on Corridor H. And environmental studies for the remaining sections are still ongoing. The, the last thing we want to do is for our work to have an impact on natural resources that, that is negative. And anytime that, we, uh, anytime that we do have a negative impact on any project, we always try to mitigate that. We engineer around those things. It's likely impossible to make everyone happy with the final path of the road. You know, Blackwater Canyon is called West Virginia's scenic crown jewel. Why would you want a highway through it? Ultimately, from my standpoint, I'd just like to see it completed. <laughs> In West Virginia, Stephanie Liebergen, Newsy. Folks, we're not done talking about infrastructure yet. We're going to turn this into Infrastructure Hour on ITL. Here to talk to us a bit more about this is Newsy Stephanie Liebergen. Uh, Steph, which state is getting the biggest chunk of money for this highway system? So there are 11 states that are, go that are going to be splitting the $1.25 billion that's set aside in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Now, two states, New York and South Carolina, have already finished their portions of the highway, so that's why they're not included in the split of the money. Now, Alabama is actually the state that's set to get the biggest chunk of change, $370 million around there. Now, that money is going to go towards a new highway to build a northern highway loop around Birmingham on the northern side. And that's something that their representative, Gary Palmer, told me is really needed to help reduce truck traffic driving through downtown Birmingham. If we had the northern belt line, those would, would be diverted north of the city. They wouldn't pass through there. It would substantially reduce congestion, substantially reduce emissions, in a city that's in a valley, by the way, which in the summertime you have the ozone issues. So. Truck traffic, a key benefit not only in West Virginia, as we heard with the winter roads, but also in Alabama, both states that are hoping to benefit from this infrastructure bill 
if it finally makes its way all the way through Congress. You know, I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation because off camera, we've talked a bit about, you know, what all constitutes as infrastructure. And I wanted to loop back to broadband. Um, as I mentioned before your piece, it's becoming a major part of the country's infrastructure. How might expanding highway systems also benefit internet access? How are those how are those things connected? So this is actually something that caught me by surprise and that I learned while I was on the ground in West Virginia talking to Department of Transportation officials. Now, they told me that the new road construction is directly tied to broadband expansion. So as it was explained to me, sometimes internet companies will come in and they'll lay the fiber lines down before the highway pavement even makes it down or for, you know, existing roads that are already built. The internet companies will use those existing pathways to help get broadband internet and high speed internet access to more rural, harder to reach places where it hasn't reached just yet. So uh, broadband in broadband internet access, definitely something that is starting to fit into the mold of traditional infrastructure and something that the West Virginia Department of Transportation told me they are intimately involved in expanding broadband in the state as well as, of course, making sure that roads and highways and all of that uh, is taken care of as well. Newsy Stephanie Liebergen, expanding our understanding of infrastructure. <laughs> we much appreciate it. We hope we have you back again soon. Absolutely. After the break, we're getting a little scientific. We're talking monoclonal antibody treatments and a new device that could help cut down on concussions. We know that the fastest way to stop the surge of coronavirus is to get more and more of the population vaccinated. But there's still a lot of questions about how doctors can treat unvaccinated people who get very sick or hospitalized. One treatment that's shown some progress is something called a monoclonal antibody treatment. And the Biden administration has been pushing for more distribution of this treatment. But experts say it isn't actually a cure for COVID. So what is it though? And why has it been so hard to distribute? Newsy's partnering with the Washington Post's video team, which brings you this breakdown of what the treatment really means. This is a cocktail of two monoclonal antibodies from the pharmaceutical company Legenera. In 2020, this treatment first made headlines when President Donald Trump tested positive for the coronavirus. They gave me Regeneron. And it was like unbelievable. It just made me better, okay? I call that a cure. Though Trump inaccurately called it a cure, studies have shown that it is a highly effective coronavirus treatment. Antibodies are proteins that our body makes anytime it gets any infection. It can be the flu, it can be COVID, it can be strep throat. They're normal part of our immune system. And this is how we're able to fight off different infections. I mean, monoclonal antibody therapy for COVID-19 is, I think, one of the highlights and successes we've had scientifically in the last year. Of course, the other big scientific breakthrough of the pandemic was the development of COVID-19 vaccines, which remain the most effective way to stop the spread of the virus. But monoclonal antibody therapy is also important. These monoclonal antibodies seem to be very, very effective. The, the real purpose of these is to basically prevent someone from needing to be hospitalized. If given early, uh, within 10 days of symptoms, they reduce the risk of hospitalization or death by almost 80 percent. They reduce the symptoms by four days. They reduce the amount of virus in the nose so that, you know, there's less of a chance of spreading it to a family member. As antibody treatments become more available in the United States, health experts do encourage their use. A much underutilized intervention for COVID-19. But they also warn that they are not a substitution for vaccines. The vaccine is what you take to prevent disease, what you take so that you don't get sick. Right now, the majority of the antibody treatments is to treat once you've gotten sick. So um, that's a difference, right? To prevent illness versus treat illness. Even still, the demand for antibody treatments has skyrocketed in certain areas. 
who are sick with COVID are lining up at sites like this one in Tampa, hoping for a boost in fighting it off. In September 2021, the Department of Health and Human Services took over distribution of monoclonal antibodies. The federal government has resumed control of these drugs' distribution as their use skyrocketed with the summer surge. But there are still some roadblocks in distributing the antibodies more widely. They're a lot pricier than vaccines. In fact, they're nearly 54 times the value of two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. They're also more complicated to administer. It's frozen. Uh, there has to be a pharmacist who sort of has to pull it up and, and reconstitute it. And then we have to watch that individual for one hour. So you need nurses, you need an infusion center, and you need a place where a COVID positive patient can be seen. And I think in all honesty, those three things, you know, right now we have a huge staffing and nursing uh, and healthcare shortage across the country. Uh, uh, hospitals are full, they're busy, um, and you have to see COVID positive patients. So it's not like being able to walk into your local Walgreens or CVS or Rite Aid Pharmacy and get the vaccine. So just much more operationally heavy lift. These strains on the healthcare system are a result of the highly contagious Delta variants spreading among the unvaccinated, who are far more likely to be hospitalized if they're infected. Some officials are urging healthcare providers to give priority to unvaccinated people when distributing monoclonal antibodies. I think it can be helpful treatment with the current surge, uh, but only to treat people who are already positive. It's not a fix-all, uh, and it can't prevent um, this surge from continuing, and certainly not the next surge, which we know will happen. When you ride a bike, do you wear a helmet? Sometimes I forget, but they are really important. While they can protect your skull from fracturing, that doesn't mean you still can't get a concussion. One doctor has been experimenting with other ways to keep your head safe while playing sports or just going for a casual or competitive bike ride. Let's hop on some city bikes and see who's faster, yeah? Okay, you'd probably win. As Usher Qureshi explains, this doctor has created a collar that could prevent your brain from moving around if you take a hit. Taking a hit to the noggin could knock your lights out. And while helmets can protect the skull from fracturing, there is no concussion proof helmet. They can't prevent concussion. Neurosurgeon Dr. Julian Bales, a former team doctor for the Pittsburgh Steelers, is an expert on concussions and head injuries. The human brain floats inside the skull. So when a person or a helmeted head suddenly hits another or the ground or some object, uh, the, the brain can still shift. He says it's that sudden jerking of the head that causes the brain to rattle around inside the skull. It's called brain-skull decoupling. It's not one unit, it's separated. And that can lead to injury, can lead to major injury. Uh, it can lead to concussion. I've had two in the past and both were relatively mild. I was out for about a week from sports. It's an experience Cooper Prodzik knows well. He played lacrosse, hockey, and football in high school, suffering two concussions along the way. I didn't ever have like memory loss or any of that. It was just more of constant headaches for the next couple of days following. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that 5 to 10 percent of athletes will experience a concussion in any given sports season. For the last 12 years, Dr. Bales has been working with a team of scientists to see if they could create internal protection for the brain. It's spring-loaded with a special steel spring. What they came up with is this $200 band that fits around the neck called the Q-collar. Q30, the company that makes the band, provided this video of the device that places about 1.2 pounds of pressure onto the athlete's jugular vein. The pressure is here so that when you place it on, it approximates near the jugular vein, which is superficial, thin walled right here. Bill says the collar puts a kink in that hose. Slowing drainage, capillaries around the brain fill up with an extra tablespoon or so of blood, which creates a cushion for the brain like bubble wrap. But this is enough apparently to just raise the amount of blood inside capacitance, vessels of the brain, that it eliminates, makes it a tighter fit. It eliminates the ability of it to move or shift. 
A study from the FDA looking at football players found 77% of those who wore the Q collar during a season of play showed MRIs with no significant changes in white matter regions of the brain, while 73% of those who did not wear the collar exhibited significant changes in those same deep brain tissues. Earlier this year, the FDA cleared the collar for use in athletes aged 13 and up. I think that even just taking the extra step and wearing that piece of equipment is very, very worth it and can help you out in the long run. It's already being used in hockey, football, and soccer. The most popular sport in the world, maybe 250 million participants, has no, no way to protect their, their brain. And so it may be especially attractive for sports such as that. And if all continues to go well, athletes could find a cue collar as common as a mouth guard. In Evanston, Illinois, I'm Usher Qureshi reporting. Before we sign off for the night, we're going to take you back through our top stories of the day and give you a little refresher so you can wake up tomorrow feeling, you know, in the loop. Man, this show is corny. Anyway, we'll be right back. And now it's time to finish off the night with Closing the Loop. We started off the show with a deep dive on cryptocurrency, the good, the bad, and the ugly. This week, the US Justice Department launched new efforts to keep a more watchful eye on cryptocurrency and cybercrime. But while the US government seems skeptical of digital currency, around the world, many other nations are embracing cryptocurrency in new ways, whether making crypto an official currency or just pushing their citizens to use it. That's right, it's not just the Bitcoin bros in your group chats who are buying into this, it's whole governments. The appeal of cryptocurrency is that saying the word crypto is in vogue, but also it's a cheaper, quicker, and easier way to spend and move money that lets people have more control over their finances. You know, you have hyperinflation where people don't really trust the central bank or they don't trust the government's monetary policy you know, are places where it's gotten a lot of uh, traction. And, you know, in a way, it's, it's a way of either outsourcing uh, monetary policy, or it's a way of saying, you know, we're not going to peg our currency to the dollar, because we don't want to be just dependent on the US or the euro or the UK or, or wherever else. You know, we, we trust this algorithm because it's transparent and we understand that. In September, El Salvador became the first country to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. Like many developing countries, El Salvador relies heavily on what's called the remittance market, meaning about $6 billion annually comes from Salvadorans working in the US sending money back to their families at home. With cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, Money doesn't have to go through a bank. And now our other top story, Newsy Stephanie Liebergen took us to West Virginia to show us real life impacts of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. The bipartisan infrastructure plan will make billions of dollars available to states across the country. But one of the few projects to get dedicated funding is this one, the Appalachian Development Highway System. The infrastructure bill sets aside $1.25 billion for the system. States will share those funds with West Virginia set to get the second largest amount, about $195 million. West Virginia will use some of its federal funding to build a new section of Corridor H. That will build a four lane highway across this valley and over the Cheat River. Construction beyond that is among the most heavily contested. We're most concerned about impacts to Blackwater Canyon, which to us is absolutely sacred ground, and to the two charming little historic towns that uh, the proposed route would go between. The bipartisan infrastructure funding will cover just a fraction of what West Virginia needs to finish construction on Corridor H. And environmental studies for the remaining sections are still ongoing. The, the last thing we want to do is for our work to have an impact on natural resources that, that is negative. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching In The Loop. I'm Christian Bryant. Evening Debrief is coming at you next. Mm -hmm.